very brave and you know why because you showed up for a sermon that has sorrow in the title <laughs> and those of you on zoom as well so the poem that I'm going to be reading to you today is from Kwame Dawes and the title is when light leaves her eyes and I want you to think about times in your life where your sorrow was so deep that the light left your eyes. Who owns you? There is in the eyes of those who have lost the bodies of their impossible loves, the young, unformed perfection of youth dead before the inevitable corruption of time. There is, in the eyes of those who have lost this love to the vagaries of war, the drugged look of those whose light has faded. What has been taken from you? It is this that owns you. And you, shell of all joy, must walk through the city as beautiful as the last summer flowers. Thank you, Noreen. And thank you, Lorraine. As you've heard, I'm one of the lay leaders at the UU Coastside community, UUCC, centered in Half Moon Bay. Our two congregations somewhat know each other. <coughs> See? Um, mainly through shared pulpit class of 2021-2022. Uh, Members of three congregations participated. This congregation, my congregation at UUCC, and a pair from UUSM, the UUs of San Mateo. And in July of 2022, Reverend Russ drove up to speak at UUCC at Odd Fellows Hall. That's the space that we rent uh, for our services. And last August, Sylvia Forsythe spoke to UUCC over Zoom. So our two congregations somewhat know each other. And today, I want to speak about sorrow, which seems to have packed them all in. Um, I want to speak from my own experience, uh, speak from some of the emotions I've observed among UU congregations, about UU Coastside and other congregations, about their experiences around the pandemic. And some of it involves sorrow. Maybe I'm thinking out loud, trying to express my feelings out loud, and maybe you all have become only an accidental audience for my musings out loud. About a year and a half ago, I learned about ambiguous loss 
as an idea, ambiguous loss as a term from clinical psychology. It was in her clinical practice that psychologist Pauline Boss first conceived of or named ambiguous loss. One canonical example, during the Vietnam War, four American pilots shot down and captured. Their spouses and children entered this in-between state. Their husband and father was not dead, but also profoundly absent from their lives. Those who have lost this love to the vagaries of war. To such losses, there's no clear end to the mourning period. These losses seem open-ended, so ambiguous. And it was in her own life that Pauline Boss experienced ambiguous loss most deeply. Her husband aging into loss of cognitive function. She experienced losing her husband by degrees, over time, with no definite date, no time stamp, a parent, partner, or sibling sliding into memory care. The drug looked of those whose light has faded. This constitutes a second canonical example of ambiguous loss. These losses have no clear date or time stamp. And maybe I thought this was a way to talk about our shared pandemic experience. That was my thinking. Because during the pandemic, services only over Zoom, a congregation is both together and not together. And being together is the meaning of the word congregation. We move into a state of being somewhat in touch and not quite in touch. In touch only over Zoom. And then, and then, my life went full tilt ambiguous. Brief personal recap. By working from home, I'm able to conclude projects, but not really launch new ones. By slow degrees, I lose connections to family, to my then network of friends, to coworkers. I retire and I lose my spiritual guide. It's two spiritual guides actually, but who's counting? I do not claim my experience is unique. In fact, I strongly suspect that some or many of you relate to parts of my story. Indeed, many of you can probably just easily outdo me in these waves of relationships dissolving into what? Question marks? And as today's poet Kwame Dawes says, what has been taken from you, it is this that owns you. So under stress, there is perhaps a natural tendency to retreat, pull back, help less, close down. Many congregations have experienced this, a decline in volunteering, say, in wanting to attend, to join or be active. And anger, anger I guess is an option, lashing out, recasting a toe stub or stumble of another into a hill of insult 
and a mountain of woe. Anger, it's on the list of empirically observed responses. Anyway, there is a third response, a third conceivable response. Paradoxical, either in its origin or by its effect. And that is to name the pain as pain, the grief as grief, and the never-ending, open-ended sorrow as sorrow. To call out our own broken heart as a broken heart. Naming the emotions you feel, naming them to yourself, maybe to others, maybe by getting the name right, saying the issue out loud, maybe that helps. Yiddish has a word for this jumble of feelings that follow ambiguous loss. Say broken Kate. This makes it a multimedia presentation. <laughs> so broken Kate has an approximate cognate in English, brokenness. If that helps you latch on to these four consonant reach rich syllables. So broken kite is a quality of brokenness that suggests something not quite needing a quick fix. A sort of bittersweet wisdom state. To be held, stood over, contemplated, maybe even honored. Somehow in sorrow, a sorrow that looks out and recognizes the complexities of one's life and of life in general. For Pauline Boss, recognizing ambiguous loss, say broken Kate, this is not healing. This is not healing. But it is growing. It is growing. It's experiencing say broken kite does not exclude joy or happy moments. One learns to live with a complex of emotions side by side with say broken kite. Even with say broken kite, we sing. We continue to sing. We, the broken hearted, we can lift up our chins and sing. To sing as if there is more love somewhere. Like that guy. <laughs> I am reminded of the funeral of my PhD advisor. He died of Parkinson's disease many years ago after his initial diagnosis. Sort of by accident, at his funeral, I encounter his widow, face to face. She just exiting the sanctuary, me trying to re-enter the sanctuary. She looked at me. She made eye contact with me. I, who was important to her world, unimportant to nearly the whole world. And she said, hi. She was kind. She, in the depth of her mourning, she was kind to me as a reflex. She was kind because she had primed herself to be ready to be kind. And from this kindness done to me 20 years ago, 
is born a message I now wish to pass on to all of you. You know, in a sermon, I'm supposed to ask something of you, to work around toward issuing all of you a call to action. That's the term of art, a call to action. And so I ask all of you to be kind. This is my particular request, to be kind. This is my call to action, to explore what comes from becoming deliberately kind. Let me just say a little bit more about kindness. In today's metta chant, the word metta comes from Pali, the language of much of Buddhist scripture. It's usually translated as loving kindness. And the idea of metta, of loving kindness, it is that by reciting these words, you shift your view, our view, of the world toward being kinder. Psychologists have a concept, the default mode network. It's basically your brain state when you're not actually focused on something. It's more stable than a mood and more adaptable than, say, your base personality. So the Meta chant is a mantra designed to nudge your brain towards something kinder, something more Meta. The metta chant isn't some form of magical thinking. It's a means of nudging your default mode network toward a kinder state, becoming kinder, a kinder person by default. And I hope you can see how practicing such loving kindness can coexist with sorrow, can coexist with, say, broken kite, like co-travelers, different from one another, but also traveling comfortably together. A second form of kindness involves the twin concepts, gratitude and generosity. Like Meta, these both in Unlike metta, these both involve greater intentionality. With gratitude, you are, we are, expressing our thanks for something verbally, with words, if only to ourselves. And I hope you can see how a little practice can turn gratitude into a habit of regular thought. Like, hurrah, so many of you showed up. <laughs> Some even choosing to sit in the front row. <laughs> or, I really enjoyed hearing that rooster chatter outside the <laughs> sanctuary. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you noticed him too. I hope you can see how gratitude can, can coexist with sorrow, with brokenheartedness. A co-traveler in a journey that is our life. Different from sorrow, but somehow traveling comfortably 
together. Generosity is the action-oriented sister to gratitude. Generosity means giving something of yourself. Time, say, volunteer hours, committee work, loud singing, <laughs> and or money. Indeed, some UU congregations call the offertory process the practice of generosity. This is because generosity can be cultivated as a habit. Generosity and its cultivation, both of these are products of intention which then becomes action. In that order, intention then action. I hope you can all see how practicing generosity can coexist with the empty feelings of loss and sorrow. Like two bricks that help balance each other in the load that is our backpack of life. A third manifestation of kindness is chesed. Chesed is a Hebrew word often translated as, well, loving kindness. How many of these do you think I have? <laughs> All right, so unlike meta loving kindness, Chesed involves deeds. Unlike generosity, Chesed involves deeds of kindness not asked for and not actually all that convenient. To me, Chesed is best described by this example. If you help a neighbor to carry something and it's on your way, then it's not Chesed. If, on the other hand, you help your neighbor carry something and it's out of your way, that's chesed. Chesed consists of good deeds done in spite of their inconvenience. In my own particular, my own peculiar life, my clearest acts of chesed involve some version of elder care, if that helps clarify the concept. Caregiving involves a lot of chesed. Give us this day our daily chesed. Which brings me to the chesed stories. Like this one for Carmel, an elderly nearby neighbor with mobility issues, particularly around stairs. Every morning before 10 a.m., I walk to Carmel's house, bring up her newspaper and yesterday's mail, up the stairs to her front door, and then take down a bowl of bird seed, which I scatter on the ground, mainly for the finches. Mission Carmel. That's what my wife and I call this task. And Carmel's neighborhood cat seems to have taken a liking to me. A white and black cat that seems to like me coming around comes by for a few strokes. This cat is not Carmel's as far as I know, but is, like me, a bird watcher. <laughs> Although perhaps doing so with different underlying values. <laughs> One day, Carmel's daughter, visiting, comes out. She says, you know, you know, I know you're from a church. 
I just want you to know, you're not going to get anything when my mother dies. <laughs> yes, I know. And Carmel seems to like me fetching up her mail. And this cat seems to like me too. Hess's stories are all like this. Person X does Hesed for person Y, and person Z expresses confusion. <laughs> like, like why? In Hesed stories, person Z, person Z con expresses confusion rather than gratitude. Like, it doesn't even come to mind. Like saying thank you doesn't even occur to person Z as an option. That's the source of the underlying comedy. And that cat comedy sort of helps too, the presence of a not very effective predator sort of tickling our imagination. Give us this day our daily chesed. Chesed is the form that kindness takes when you no longer filter prospective tasks by your per personal convenience or inconvenience. And I put this idea out there in hopes of enriching our common vocabulary around kindness. And and I hope you can see how doing chesed can coexist with holding sorrow. Something like, my world hurts so much, so how big a deal is a little incremental inconvenience anyway? I do these kindnesses not in spite of sorrow, but because I seek something to carry on my back alongside my sorrow. And as a co-traveler with my sorrow, different yes and weighty yes, and also helping me to bear the weight of sorrow with a balancing weight, the weight of being inconvenienced by some act of kindness. Some might think that sorrow and kindness, say broken Kate and chesed, that they might not naturally pair. But as my advisor's widow taught me, simply when she said hi to me, I say they do. They do indeed go together. Poet Naomi Shahab Nye says it this way, before you understand what kindness really is, you must lose things. And she continues, before you know that kindness is the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore. Mm -hmm. Only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to gaze at bread. Only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I that you have been looking for. And then goes with you everywhere, like a shadow or a friend. Mm -hmm. Go with kindness. Amen. I'm sitting here on
So one recent evening, stepping out my front door, I heard a solitary bird singing from the telephone wire. But why? I regularly feed birds in the morning. When I go out to refill the feeders with bird seed, they sing. They chatter. It's morning. The day is just beginning. Breakfast's arriving. The warm sun is coming. Time to mark off territory. There are reasons to sing in the morning. 
But why sing in the evening? It's only growing colder, only growing darker, no food in prospect, the day is wrapping up. Why sing in the evening? Maybe for one of two reasons. One, to announce this moment in my life, this too is a moment in my life. And I sing because each moment is beautiful, even in the lengthening shadows. It's a default mode network thing. And two, that this moment is a moment in a cycle. What comes next is the turning of the cycle, for the cycle is always turning. To this world growing now colder, my rejoinder is gratitude. So I sing in gratitude. I sing exuberantly, generously, exultantly to this darkening sky which signals the end and the beginning of a cycle as if there were more love somewhere. I sing forth. I sing in offering. Offering in this way new hope. I offer my song to those that choose to listen and to the universe, which is always listening. Go in peace. <laughs>